And welcome everybody to the um, board meeting for September. Um, we made it. We got our school open. Um, and I think that is totally a reason to celebrate. Um, I had a, spent many times walking down the, the, the sidewalks and watching the kids play in the playgrounds and uh, they were all socially distanced wearing their mask and it was just wonderful to see. Um, to walk through our village again and hear kids talking about their days in school and what they were learning and just the excitement was just it was it was really a good week for everybody i don't know if you guys ever saw come from away but there's a line in there about planes are meant to fly and i think it's true that schools are meant to have kids in them and meant to learn and it was a credit to everybody um, from the administration the teachers the teachers association union the clerical staff parents everybody um, deserves a big thanks for helping us get to where we are so tonight's meeting is going to be relatively short because we want to honor the fact that a lot of people want to get to the high school back to school night. Um, and so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Montesano. Do you want to do the um, approval of the minutes first, Arlene? Oh, sure. Sorry. In my That's excitement okay. to get through. Um, <laughs> we have two sets of minutes to be approved. Do I have a motion? So move. Second. Second. Who was second? <laughs> Mr. Carvin? All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you. Roy, now to you. Great. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's certainly terrific to be here. Um, Brian, if you're still on, if you can give me sh uh, screen sharing rights, please, I'd appreciate that. I'd like to share my screen. Um, but um, I want to let you know that our first four days of in-person school uh, is official. And um, I can think I can do this now. Here we go. Uh, okay, hold on one second. There you go. So, um, and in our opinion, things have gone really, really well, better than perhaps we could have could have expected, uh, given everything we've gone through with the pandemic and our construction. Um, big shout out and appreciation to Mike Lee and the maintenance and custodial crew for preparing our buildings, keeping things clean. Amazing how much work has been completed uh, over the past couple of weeks to really get us to a point where, where we could uh, officially reopen. We know it was touch and go for a while. And it's just the transformation of our building has been just absolutely nothing short of a miracle. Um, some of our guys have really been working literally two to three weeks straight without a break uh, because they care so much about our school and our community and getting our kids back uh, into the classroom. Uh, I also wanna take just a quick moment to acknowledge the work of our administrative team and our staff the amount of prep work and getting organized from new arrival dismissal procedures, temperature checks each morning, health screening follow-ups has made such a difference for us. Uh, and it's really um, able to, um, you know, the, the ease in which kids are coming into the building right now um, is just a tribute to all the planning and efforts that have gone from the administrative group. Um, so far, things have seem to be working. We hope that continues and the parents have been very cooperative with us so far. Uh, and the teachers have just been absolutely amazing. Um, many are feeling frustrated a little bit because they can't be the uh, best teaching, best teacher that they know they can be due to the limitations of space and kids behind shields and teachers needing, needing to be on the screen for those at home as well as those um, in the classroom. But um, they're adjusting and I know it's gonna get better each and every day. Um, and finally, I want to thank the students because they've been terrific this first week, I have to tell you, and really following the guidelines, wearing their masks, adjusting to this kind of new normal thing that we call school. Um, but they've been absolutely terrific, um, and we couldn't do without their, uh, without their cooperation. Um, so that first thing that you see on the screen there um, is kind of pictures from our opening day. So you'll see the elementary school was were all out on the uh, on the field uh, for, for lineup so we can get the kids in safely on that first day. They start to understand the protocols. You'll see the uh, that classroom on the right is um, the one of the um, playrooms actually in the elementary school that's been transformed into a classroom. Uh, and you can see the desk shields and the spacing of the desks uh, as well and the teacher walking around. And um, the, the last picture on the bottom is um, from our lunchtime. Uh, elementary school students are having lunch outside in the front lawn. It's been great that we've had such nice weather for this first week of school um, and they were taking advantage 
taking advantage of that, uh, the lawn and the spacing, uh, which has been terrific. Um, so I'm very confident that barring some kind of outbreak where we'd have to shut the school down, we're going to get better and the teachers will get better and the kids will get better. And I just want to take the opportunity uh, to remind everyone of our protocols that in place and ask for your continued cooperation and patience um, as we get through this together. And if our, there are any questions, please reach out. The feedback has been terrific uh, for us. Uh, and you know it's important for us to know the parental perspective uh, so we can adjust accordingly. So thank you to everybody for making this possible. Thank you, um, Roy, for your leadership. And it's not just this past week, it's been going on for months, you and Rachel and Dan and everybody, uh, but the leadership from the top really tells here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tom, I appreciate the comments. Uh, some, some other good news, um, we're notified by the New York State Ed Department that the Bronxville Elementary School and Bronxville High School have been designated as recognition schools, which is based on their high achievement, the growth and graduation rate. So I'll be passing these uh, certificates on to the principals for display. So congratulations to uh, the elementary uh, staff, high school staff, and, and to uh, Anne and to Tricia for their leadership. Uh, congratulations. Yeah, very nice. Very nice. I'm going to move now on to um, our uh, enrollment and, uh, and class size report, which is something we do every year. Um, so you can see on there uh, our current enrollment as of this Monday and where we were projected based on the demographic report from, from last year. And you know we're running pretty close to what the demographic report said. You notice in kindergarten, it's up to 92 students. You're not seeing it, Roy. Are, you're not seeing that? Oh, yes, hmm. I am. No, I, ha I have it. Yeah, I can see it. Hmm. Okay. I got uh, it. All right. <laughs> anyway. <I don't. laughs> uh, uh, okay, um, I'll go on. Um, sorry, Jack, you're not seeing it. I don't know why. Okay. No problem. Uh, okay. Keep on going. Okay, fair enough. So uh, it was like three weeks ago, I think I reported to the board we were running about 80 students in the kindergarten. Now we're up to 92. We had a late uh, run on registration, I think through some housing turnover that happened as well that brought some, some additional students in. Uh, so we're at 92 currently. Um, you can see that our, our enrollment uh, is slightly <clears throat> higher than what was projected. And I think that had to do more with um, some housing turnover than anything else. Uh, at the middle school, you know, that one bubble we have is just kind of still going through a little bit, but um, their enrollment's down from last year, uh, from what was projected. Um, and, and the high school uh, is up from what was projected overall. So we're just slightly up, but pretty close to what the, what the projection was going to be. So um, overall elementary school enrollment was down by 20 students compared to last year. Middle school is up by nine students compared to last year and the high school and down by four students. Um, but again, some of this is, is based on housing turnover that I'm not sure how we control for. Um, in terms of class sizes, um, it's pretty similar to what we've had in the past. Um, the overall average at the elementary school is running about 21 and a half students. You can see the numbers there. Um, we have a remote section in grade three and a remote section in grade five. Um, other than that, where you are, we're pretty good on our uh, class sizes at the middle school. Hey, Roy, Roy, just, yes. John, just before you move on from that, yep. seeing seven sections in fifth grade seems like a lot. Is that, is that because of the remote? That's because of the remote, John, yeah. Um, you know, we were trying to adjust it based on the feedback we got in terms of how many kids will be running, uh, coming from remote. So uh, originally we had five sections in kindergarten and we thought we could manage that better because we, we you know, Roman was looking at the time was about 80 students or so. So we moved that section to fifth grade where we thought we needed it because of the uh, number of people who said they were gonna be learning remotely. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the middle school, again, uh, similar class sizes to the previous year, overall average in the core areas running about 21.4 compared to last year was 20.5. So similar to what, what you'd might expect um, and there's not too many classes that uh, really are above, you know, that 25 number uh, for us, which is, which is really a good thing. And finally, in the high school, again, very similar to the previous year, this year averaging about 19.7 compared to 19.1 the, uh, the previous year. Um, they, we, we try to keep those sections as uh, under 
30 as best we can. You can see there are some that, that run above that based on uh, some singleton classes, some AP classes and things like that that are really hard to control for. But um, I know Ann's done a great job and I guidance department's done a great job in trying to balancing, uh, balance all that out. Um, just a, a couple of things I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment. Um, just a couple other things to uh, let the board know. We have a new requirement from the state <clears throat> this year that we have now have to report the daily report daily on the number of students and staff who have been tested for COVID. How many of those tests were positive, um, based on information that we gather or, or that people tell us. I think the state is just trying to gather as much information as they possibly can. They've set up a dashboard for uh, for parents to go to if they want that information. Uh, trying to keep people as informed as they can to see track infection rates and, 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 the, and the like. Um, we're aware of a few students who have been tested um, who are symptomatic and fortunately, uh, based on what we know, they've all come back negative. So that's been great for, for us. Um, as we enter the, this normal cold and flu season that we're gonna be entering very soon, it's gonna be a bit trickier for everyone. Because as you know, the uh, daily questionnaire has symptoms on it that mirror symptoms of the regular flu. But we're going to, you know, be, err on the side of caution and conservative, uh, being conservative, and having kids in school. Um, the other thing I want to let everyone know is uh, we learned recently that the state uh, is commandeering our school to be used as a polling place on November third. Um, <clears throat> we don't have a choice, from my understanding, in in allowing this to happen or not happen. So um, I, I'm gonna recommend to the board that we take November 3rd as a fully remote learning day for everybody. Um, so we can still count it as a day of school. Um, but with people coming in out of the building, I'm very concerned um, and we wanna have enough time to clean in between. So uh, I don't want, I'd rather not have any, any students in uh, for that day. Uh, so uh, I will be announcing and let everybody know that November 3rd with the board approval will be a, a remote learning day since we're set up to do that anyway. What about the next day, given the time, given how late the polls close? Yeah, I think we can do it, Jack, but it, it's, it's not the entire building you're using. You know, it's really, okay. it, it's really limited to the, uh, to the gym. So we can get them in the one door and pretty out pretty quickly. So it's really um, contained. Uh, so I think we'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, at this time, I'm going to um, ask uh, Joe Haven, our new athletic director, to uh, provide an update on athletics as he's received it from the state. I'm going to just share my screen so you can see Joe's report up there as well. Um, I hope I'm going to anyway. So, oops. Um, here we go. This, this. I'll be with you in one second, if you don't mind. Uh, no, that's not it. Hold on. Can you see that or no? No. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Little technical glitch I'll get through. I don't know why I can't hear you. Here we go. Okay. Uh, okay. Joe, you're on. Good evening, everyone. Um, so as you know, the state um, finally allowed athletics uh, to begin um, low and moderate risk sports. State Association set the date of September 21st for all low to moderate sports to begin. Um, in the fall for that for us, that's cross country, tennis, field hockey, and both soccer, boys and girls. Um, section one decided that we're not going to start until the 29th. Um, section one leadership just decided that having an extra week off um, just to make sure there's no infection rate in school where you know, obviously we're here for our academics first, school is flowing smoothly, they decide to start the 29th. Um, so on, on the 29th, we will start with those programs. And those are high school programs only. Um, so far, we've been given no guidance from middle school athletes, which is something eighth graders. So at this time, we've had, there's no modified sports included in this. So just starting will be those five high school sports. As you can see, football and field hockey, and for us, um, a couple volleyball players, um, they have deemed those um, high risk uh, sports. So they're moving those back to what they're calling uh, fall session two. And fall session two will start March 1st. And just so everybody is aware, um, the governor will determine 
if those sports are no longer high risk. At this point, those sports are considered high risk along with, for us, basketball, hockey, um, so at, and lacrosse. So at this point, as up until currently, up until uh, December 30th, we cannot have those sports participate. He said he will make a decision before the 30th whether we're going to change that or not. Um, so with the later start date for the 29th, what, what, what the state has done is they have moved the end date of fall sports to November 30th. Well, I say November 29th because the winter sports are going to start November 30th. Now, sections have the right to end a week earlier if they'd like. Uh, each section will have their own choice of when they want to end the fall season, but it must be completed by the 29th of November so that the indoor sports can start on November uh, 30th. And like I said, very important to us because, because of hockey and uh, basketball, um, those sports haven't been approved yet. The main reason is they're indoor sports. Um, so then our, our winter season is going to go from November 30th until the last day of February. That's a very long season. And then we'll start the fall sports two season, which is um, the football um, in field hockey. But you'll also notice that we are not doing swim in the fall. And that was not because it's a high risk sport. It was done because section one, like many other sections, rent high school facilities for swim. And there's no availability for us to have swim go on during that time. So um, swim will be also moved to the February, um, or excuse me, to the March 1st date. And it, swim may start a little bit earlier depending on the boys' season in the winter. And then what that does is that pushes back the start of our spring sports to April 19th. Now, I did listen to the, uh, to the director of our state association speak yesterday. And one thing he said that was very interesting if, um, if the state decides there are no regions this year, they're going to try to continue the, uh, the spring season to the end of June. Obviously, if there are regions still going on. They will end it before the regions begin. They said they may take it up afterwards, but that'll be a discussion I'm sure he has with superintendents. Um, but as of right now, if there are no regions, he's going to continue the spring season um, right until the end of the, you know, until graduation. I would let you know that um, there are four sections in the, in the state of the 11 sections. Four of them have completely shut down for the fall season. And those are section four, which is the southern tier. Section eight, which is Nassau County. Section nine, which is Orange County, Ulster County, D Dutchess County. And then such, section 11, which is Suffolk County. Section three in the last few days, which is the Syracuse area, has seen a quarter of their schools independently shut down. Um, but we do have five sections that are full go, uh, and that includes us. And that is basically where we are at at this moment. Uh, we've had some discussion already uh, previously during the summer about making some opportunities for our modified athletes um, if there is no season. And that's something we will work with um, with the coaches um, about doing some clinics for the kids um, just to make sure it's an intramural program, just to make sure they do get the opportunity to get out and compete be with their coaches. They don't compete with themselves um, in, in school type, uh, our own school setting, but they'll have the opportunity to get out and be with their friends, their, at, their friends, their athletes, do some competitive things. And our football program is planning on doing the same thing where they're going to go out and they're going to, uh, I was working with Patsy and he's going to group kids together. Uh, we're going to do some small sided stuff uh, for the football program, obviously, but we're going to ensure social distancing the whole time. And that's the plan for uh, the fall season as we, as it stands. Great, thank you, Joe. Um, any questions from the board on that? Yeah, it's John. Hi, Joe, thank you for that. Well, welcome again. Um, I'm sure this is what you were hoping to do on your <laughs> starting, uh, starting plan. Um, will, will the sports, I have two questions. One, will the sports that are, that are kind of gonna be going up and running, will they be interscholastic or, or will they be sort of intramural in nature? In other words, will cross country have meets against other schools? Um, the second part of my question is, given the limited number of sports, are, are we planning on having um, larger teams? I mean, are we going to try and make accommodations for having a lot more people who would otherwise maybe be doing something else, be doing the sports that are allowed? Thank you. Right. So for part one of that, yes, we will be competing against other schools. Um, up until uh, the 19th of October, we have to stay within our region, within our section. After the 19th, if we have games outside the region, 
we can do that. We will be competing against our league opponents. Uh, section one is currently developing schedules where we would play each league opponent twice. And then after that's completed, we can go out and find additional games if we'd like. So that is the first question. Um, social distancing is huge. Um, the state does mandate that athletes participate with face masks on. Their faces must be covered unless the athletes can't tolerate it. So I don't know how that's going to work out, but the guidance that is coming from the state is saying that athletes during practices, if they're not social distance, must wear a mask over their face. Um, and then obviously during games, the same thing, unless they can't tolerate it. Uh, cross country is interesting because that's one of the few sports they put a stipulation on. Um, teams can only have 12 athletes at an event and only four, four schools per event. So you're not going to see any big invitationals uh, for this fall. And when we have a bigger team, there will be some JV meets that will be individual without the, without the varsity athletes at them. But that is very important for us to uh, make sure athletes keep running. And, and what was your second question again? The second part? Oh, the large is it accommodating more demand, basically, like if you go, you know. Right. So we've been, we've been watching the numbers uh, through Family ID. And currently, we are probably about 120 people under last year. And I'm assuming that's the, the athletes, for instance, football athletes um, who currently cannot participate right now. Some of them have not registered for Family ID yet. And then some of our modified athletes. Uh, when I did the parent Zoom last week, I informed them that, that modified has not been approved yet. I did encourage them still to sign up um, because the worst thing that'll happen is that we have their information. So when the winter season starts, we have their information already started. Um, the coaches do understand that um, rosters may be getting a little bit bigger. The only problem with that is we still need to transport our athletes. Um, and also too, during games and things, we still need to practice social distance on the bench. And so um, I don't see our teams automatically getting larger. I, I'm assuming we'll have a few more student athletes try to APP, come up from 7th, 8th grade up to the JV or varsity team. Um, but as the numbers are showing right now, we're not in a situation where our teams are growing that huge yet. Now, obviously, we do have two weeks till the season starts, so it'll be interesting to see how we, we get to that point. But I do think what might help us um, keep that down a little bit is by offering intramural things for the kids who are not having the opportunity to participate um, on a school-based setting against other schools. So we're going to have that opportunity for our student athletes and for some of our modified athletes, that might be a great opportunity for a nice introduction into athletics, stay for school a couple of days a week, figuring out what's going on. So that way when the fall comes, they're sort of used to, or excuse me, when winter comes, they're used to the process and it makes uh, traveling to games and, and come almost every day uh, a little bit smoother transition for them. So for intramural options, are you just thinking the intramural version of what we already offer or are you thinking about adding other sports you know, as an example, like an ultimate Frisbee, something that would be allowed with social distancing, but is not really a varsity sport type offering. Right. I have not discussed that part of it yet, to be honest with you. I've had discussions with, it, with the head varsity coaches, many of them, about what will we do with your modified athletes. We, obviously, modified is what builds your program. We, don't, we do not want to lose the modified student athlete because uh, obviously that's our future. So currently we're, we're speaking about that. Um, like, and like I said, section one has not given us any guidance yet on what's happening for modified. So I don't want to fully get involved with it yet. Um, just in case they decide, you know what, go ahead and modified sports. I do think it's a long shot to have modified sports this year. Um, but the additional sports I have not looked into yet, to be honest with you, but that would be something that if we're not having a large sign up um, with the traditional sports, I wouldn't mind to talk to Jillian and the phys ed department and see if they have some ideas of other things we can do to encourage even more student athletes to come Yeah, out. I mean, I, just for what it's worth, I would encourage that because we have, you know, in any given year, we have a lot of kids who don't participate in what I would call the main, the main sports programs. We do have a lot of people who participate in the main ones, but right now I just think it's just, it's just more important than ever to get kids moving around, participating, you know, doing something physical, getting back to like some level of normalcy. Okay. So I couldn't agree. Thanks. I couldn't Thank agree. You. I could not agree more. If these uh, state authorities, um, the Athletic Association, much less Session 1, and I'm unaware of the law that provides them with any authority over our extracurricular programs, and there is no marginal increased risk of spread when we're talking about our kids playing with our kids, uh, assuming we observe social uh, guidance, social guidelines as, and distancing as, as best we're able, for instance, 
It was my understanding that Patsy, uh, uh, the football coach, and by the way, in Lohud, our football team is featured today as, as the state of the program. But it was my understanding that uh, once they have out, once they've ruled against or postponed um, interscholastic competition, then their authority over our intra-scholastic program ends. And our students, uh, Patsy, should be able to have football practice come October on um, September 29th. Absolutely, it's staying in-house. Uh, I've had discussions with Patsy. We're actually going to meet about it next week, and we're going to determine. We're we're going to um, plan out his season for him. I just saw some schools are going to seven on seven opportunities, and if that's an opportunity that Patsy would look into, we definitely look into that. Um, but that would be more of a type based type opportunity for athletes. But he does he is fully aware to go. His staff is fully involved and interested in working with our student athletes, and that is it's it's commendable for him because uh, some you know some people have sort of. Uh, you know, put their tail on the ground and went away saying, well, they're not letting us play. But Patsy and his staff is like, nope, what can we do to get these kids on the field? So that's, that's outstanding for him to do that. And we're, we're pretty excited about that happening. And it might be an opportunity to expand the appeal of football if everybody knows that it's just an intra Bronxville experience. And that's, you know, while not optimal, that's the reality of the best we can offer right now. And maybe March 1st happens, some magical thing happens between now and March. But frankly, I think we look at March the same way we looked at September back in April. Absolutely. And like I said, our programs will be um, advertised as open. So it's going to be an open practice for football. Open means anybody can come. And, and as we're modified, frankly, if the people who are somehow amorphously provided with the authority to provide guidance have not provided that guidance, then they've punted, for want of a better way of putting it, <laughs> on their right to provide that guidance. And we need to do the best we can for our kids. And I want these kids off Xbox and out and running around. Absolutely, I agree 100%. Thanks. Great, right. <clears throat> thanks Joe. The only thing I would add um, to what Joe mentioned, and this is really a shout out to the uh, Ed Foundation as well, um, the, the Bronxville School Foundation as well is, uh, you know, because we're limited with spectators or potentially limited spectators when, we, when we're able to do interscholastic competition, uh, the foundation last year approved a grant to purchase cameras uh, for um, Chambersfield, Hayesfield, and our main gym. Uh, and we're going to be working with local live to broadcast those games live so people can see them, you know, if they're at work or from their desk or things like that as well. So hopefully that'll come to be in time. Uh, for us to be able to do that. So yes, Roy, we, Roy, we do have um, two folks from local life coming tomorrow to check out to right. make sure they're ready to go. And they're going to start uh, installing next week. I work with Mike Lee and Dan on that. And they're getting ready to install the cameras next week. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, I do want to go into my next part, if that's okay. Um, and that is, again, as soon as I find it. Uh, <laughs> here it is. So, there we go. Okay, great. So the next part of my report is really um, something that we're, we're required to do annually, and, and that is discuss our, uh, our district emergency plans. Um, so we have a district plan and we have building plans. And just very quickly, um, <clears throat> we work with our uh, security consultant, uh, Al Terris, to uh, prepare our plans. Um, that's who we contract our security director, Rob Lancia, through as well. And they've been a great partner for us in developing our emergency management plans. Uh, the district safety plan provides a general guidance on prevention emergency management. It's posted on our website for people to see. We do develop it uh, along with our uh, Bronxville safety team. Uh, it was finalized by the team uh, on, back in June. And then we posted it because you need to post it for 30 days for a public comment. And we'll be presenting that today, is presenting today for, for uh, board approval which is something we're required to do. Uh, whoops, sorry. The building level plan is more specific in nature, um, providing course of action take during an emergency. Uh, they are considered to be confidential, which is why they're not posted uh, for anyone to see by the New York State Ed Department and Ed Law mandates. We also uh, did that in conjunction with Al Terrace and in our internal Bronxville emergency response team. <clears throat> they were done on June 10th as well. 
And once the uh, board approves them, hopefully tonight, we, uh, we need to submit them up to the state by the 15th of October. Uh, so what changes have been made? Um, this year, a little bit more comprehensive in nature, detailing more specific actions and suggestions to be taken in the event of emergency. Uh, we had a number of staff members contribute to these changes uh, for our school. And um, the pandemic had something to do with these changes. For example, we have a continuity of instruction plan uh, to um, make sure we have a plan in place in the event uh, the school shut down either for power, flooding, not that we've ever do that in Bronxville, um, terror-related event, pandemic, something like that. So we have our continuity of instruction plan. We have a continuity of operations and business plan that uh, Rachel, Dan, and, and Mike Lee worked on along with uh, Altaris to cover our business facilities, uh, HR, and security uh, to keep everything running there. We also have an infectious disease annex which was amended by our health staff that addresses not only COVID, but other medical concerns as well and, and talks about the course of action needed to address any kind of infectious diseases that might appear in school during, before, and after an outbreak. Um, so that's one of the things you'll need, you're being asked to approve tonight. The other one is a door hardening resolution. So the um, reason you're being asked to approve a resolution for this is, um, Right now, um, the state is allowing us to um, have door vision panels to to be covered during an emergency, for example, than a lockdown. <clears throat> um, but the only way we can do it legally is to have the board pass a resolution allowing us to do so. Um, so that's why you'll see that on um, the existing language in our plans. It just says turn off the lights and leave the blinds as they are. It specifically says do not cover the door window because that's what the state or um, requires or mandates that we're going to delete that because if you approve this resolution we will have our staff authorized to temporarily cover the class door panels uh, to protect students so if there's an intruder we don't want them seeing in our buildings but it does again require uh, a board resolution to do that um, so that's pretty much the emergency plan uh, and because it's a public hearing, um, I would have to entertain any questions by the board members currently or people are in public. If there is anyone in the public who want to have a question or a comment, please put it in the chat on the YouTube channel so we can respond. So first with the board members. Okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, any any comments in the chat room, Connie, that you can see? Or There's or, nothing in the chat. Nothing okay. in the chat. Great. In that case, um, the board's being asked to, uh, I assume, pass the resolution at this point. Well, I think first we, Dan, you can guide me. First, we need to approve the contract with Altaris that was attached to the board materials. Um, one thing to note is it was for the wrong years, um, but Dan mentioned to me that they would supply us with one for um, this current year, but the pricing, everything else is, is the same. Yeah, so, it's basically the same level of service we had <laughs> last year, except this year it's for a full year. Last year was only 10 months because we started later. Um, you know, I think Roy would back me up in saying Altaris has kind of been a godsend to us, especially during this, uh, this period of time. Um, first with uh, getting getting our, our safety and management of security guards together. And then, uh, you know, even in pandemic response planning, they've been, uh, they've been with us every step of the way. Um, and we finally have safety professional in the building, which, uh, you know, we, we wanted for years. Um, the other so, benefit is that by having Rob Lancey here supervising the guards, it took it away from Mike Lee, who was in charge of the guards, allowing him to focus more on the building which was desperately needed during this, during this entire time. So there are some added benefits to that. And I would just echo what Dan said, that Altaris has been a great partner with us. And when we had to submit our pandemic plans to the state, um, they helped out quite a bit with us. So I would fully support this. Wonderful. May I have a motion? Move. Second? Second. Is there any, any discussion amongst the board on the approval of the, the contract? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Connie, we passed. So then I think we now move to the adoption of the 2020-21 district safety plan and building level emergency response plan. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. 
Yeah, Tom Curran and Jack Bearworth. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. No opposed? Okay. Um, and then the last motion is the one about the uh, visual panel covering during the emergencies that was included and in, the wording was included in our materials. Um, may I have a motion? Motion. I'll second whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Jack and, and Jen? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Dr. Kelly, floor is yours. Thanks everybody, good evening. I have a number of uh, resolutions for you guys to consider this evening. Um, this is typically the agenda where um, I ask you to consider leaves as well as overages, um, which are classes that are covered by our faculty internally. Um, we have some substitute appointments as well as a few more teacher residents, substitute teacher, substitute teacher aide, and you also have before you um, two side letters um, as it relates to both the BTA and the BAA. Um, concerning enrollment of children of non-resident unit members. And then we have uh, the special other stipend list and a minor revision to the fall coaches roster. So I'd like you to consider um, the resolutions in their entirety, A through double I. I was so glad to hear you want to do them all together. <laughs> May I have a motion? So moved. Tom Evans and I saw Jack with a second. second. Any discussion by the board? All in favor? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Carlin. Uh, the board has a copy of the July 31st preliminary um, budget summary. Um, it's way too early for uh, expenditures, uh, but we are anticipating COVID related costs uh, for cleaning to put pressure on the expenditure budget. Uh, however, uh, revenues is where the bulk of the current year problem lies. We all know about the 20% reduction as the state is kind of playing chicken with the federal government um, in state aid. Uh, that amounts to about a $500,000 hole for us in our revenue budget. And this is further compounded by uh, anticipated shortfalls in interest income as rates have kind of plummeted along with the pandemic. And um, we're also looking closely at special ed tuition revenue. Um, the lone good news is that we have significant non-resident tuition revenue surplus of about 150,000, which should help in some of these other area shortfalls uh, aside from the state aid. Aside from cleaning, other anticipated shortfalls not yet quantifiable. On the expenditure side, I'm looking at private school transportation as we are forced to move to larger buses to maintain physical distance requirements. And, um, and I'm really you know, worried about cleaning and security. I'll have a better handle on those as we get through September. Um, but uh, you know, this is not going to be a typical year. This is this is going to be a, a belt tightening year. Uh, I I think it's it's highly likely that I'd recommend Roy that we freeze all non-essential spending maybe at the end of October once we get our our feet underneath us for the current year, and try and deal with this uh, as best we can. You know, luckily we're in a decent shape with our fund balance, and uh, but uh, it's gonna it's gonna be a tough year. And that'll move straight forward, straight into the budget for next year as well. Yeah. You know, when we get to creating that. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Yeah. And Dan, I know Mike, Michael Finley's not with us tonight, um, and, but this is such an important issue for the finance committee, who will be part, who partner with you and walk hand in hand. This is a critical issue for the board. We are blessed that we've been able to get to this point today. Um, but in a lot of ways, it was because we had the resources and uh, we were able to to do the changes to the building, the PP&E, et cetera, et cetera. But we're going to have to be really diligent as we go through the year. And uh, the foundation has been foundation. extremely helpful. Exactly. Exactly. And just to echo your words, you know, the fund balances are um, 
steady and sturdy, which is really good, but it's still incumbent upon us to make sure that we are very responsible in how we spend our money. Absolutely. And the foundation, um, the foundation helps those who help, help themselves, right? Like last spring leading into this, we saw that we really needed to be careful about any, any expenditures that we may have been tempted to, uh, to entertain at that time. Sure. I uh, have a few financial action items. Uh, the first one is uh, non-resident students. You heard me talk about uh, how we're doing well with tuition. We have 12 full tuition students who are non-residents, 31 faculty students, including seven uh, paying uh, the faculty tuition rate. Uh, so the board every year has to approve those non-resident students. So it has the board to approve that. So Dan, are we we going to do these all together? The uh... E through H, <laughs> we're going to do all together because they're all special. We can, we can do A through H. We have the tuition resolution, then we have uh, the special education and related services and health related contractors whom we've done business with for years. Rates are either the same or very similar to prior years. I, I would ask the board to uh, to approve those contracts for our partners for the current year. So these are all consistent with prior years. Um, I think maybe a quick question for you, Rachel. Um, the homebound, how does that get impacted by the remote learning? Right, two separate um, situations. Homebound tutoring is specifically for children who are typically ill and can't come to school. And so we're eligible, we are responsible for continuing to educate them. So that is different from remote learning. But if I'm homebound and I'm ill, could I do remote learning? Well, now you can, yes. That was, yeah, that was my question. Now I would think that, that now maybe we will not use the homebound service as much because they can just join their class conceivably. Yeah. yeah. That's right. We have an option this year that we have not had in prior years. That's correct. Okay. Okay. May I have a motion from the board for A through H? So move. Second. Second. Any discussion or questions from the board? Okay, hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Okay, back My, uh, I have a three-line three facilities update in that um, we got school open. We're still waiting for the curtain wall for the windows and the cast, uh, precast uh, molding that's looking towards end of October, uh, and we'll be focusing more on uh, the Meadow Avenue addition in the coming months. So hopefully, get that done by Christmas. Uh, financially, the project's going fairly well, despite uh, the next action item, which is change orders. Um, the largest change order is a, a net one hundred thousand dollar change order. It's actually two change orders. A, a credit and an expenditure uh, for removing the uh, contaminated oil tank. Um, so that would increase the, the net increase to the two NIRM contracts of about $100,000. And then a, a very small electrical change order for uh, uh, a fixture color change uh, for a custom color that we uh, requested in the, I believe in the cafeteria and the, um, uh, learning Commons. Okay. Dan, can we take all three together? Yes. Okay. May I have a motion to approve um, the three change orders that are listed in your agenda items? No. Second. Any discussion from the board? Do we expect many more change orders coming? There's a, there's a few. I, nothing obviously this significant. Uh, we haven't seen the window change order yet, you know, for the uh, curtain wall windows, but, you know, we're going to do what we can to, to uh, see if we can charge that to somebody. But uh, that's, uh, I think, about forty six dollars or $48,000. You'll see that coming forward soon, uh, maybe. And, um, you know, we're, we still got a ways to go in the, um, Oh, I, think, I think there's a significant electrical change order coming. I'm not sure if that falls within the allowance or not. But, uh, you know, change order wise as a percentage of the contract, this is the lowest I've ever seen on a project so far. And Dan, you, Dan, you touched upon a topic that's important. Um, 
as part of the, the budget process for the capital projects, we set up allowances for the various trades that are working on the building. Uh, these change orders uh, that we're talking about tonight, are they, are they, do they fall within, are the allowances that were set up sufficient to cover these change orders um, or not? The electrical one, yes. Uh, the uh, the oil tank, no. That's in, that's going to go straight to the contingency for the project, which is still robust. Okay. At this point. Well, let's keep an eye on that because we may have to make some difficult choices about necessity uh, versus desire. Uh, if we're you know if there's a prospect of us having to dig into our pockets here. Absolutely. Can we schedule a discussion in exec session to talk with lawyers about some of the issues that have come up? Sure. I hate talking to lawyers, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. And that's it. So hopefully people can get to the high school. Great. Any other discussion from the board members? All right, having heard none, um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the three motions carry. All right, um, watching the hour closely. Um, any committee reports? I'm not aware of any. Doesn't look like. Okay, so our next uh, board meeting, I think, is one of the most um, really interesting and fulfilling. Um, meetings is the long-term long-range planning workshop on October 5th. I really would encourage people to join in on that because we look at trends in education and um, how we just maintain our high level of education we have in our town and also look at the important topics around you know how the pandemic has impacted social justice and things like such as that. So I think it'll be a, a great meeting. So with that we have um, the public discussion and Connie do we have any questions in the queue nothing in the queue okay okay with that roy unless there's something else i'll take a motion to adjourn so move yes. okay all in favor aye. Aye. aye any opposed no enjoy your back to school night thank you thanks everybody everyone bye, -bye.